Welcome to Success in Brief. I'm your host, Roseanne Filicello. In every episode, we spotlight successful women in the law. We discuss with them their journey to success. We talk about the difficulties and the trade-offs, along with the highlights and the benefits, and about what success means to each of them. We hope to inspire you with these stories on your own path to success. Hello, my name is Roseanne Filicello, and today this is Success in Brief. I'm thrilled to re- welcome Renee Eubanks to today's podcast. Welcome, Renee. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Since October 2016, Renee has managed her own law firm, the Eubanks Law Firm, PLLC, where she focuses her practice on serving hedge funds, private equity funds, and banks in connection with purchase and sale of distressed debt, primary debt, and private equity securities. She also represents startup companies regarding corporate organizational issues, equity and no issuance, and other matters involved in seed and series A financing rounds. Renee has both her JD from Boston College and an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And in addition to running her busy law practice, Renee is the co-chair of University Settlement, a not-for-profit that works with low-income New Yorkers. I'm excited to speak to Renee and hear more about her success Uh, So let's get started. Uh, Let's jump right in, Renee. What was your path to becoming an attorney? Uh, I was one of these, and I don't know how it happened, but I actually always wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was a young girl. Um, And it was funny because so many people would be like, and I didn't realize it, they would be like, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Because I didn't realize at that time, I'm dating myself, that there were not many women lawyers at all, and certainly not many women lawyers of color. So it just seemed like a novel idea to the people that I was talking to. Um, but I kind of never lost that that desire. Um, and when I went to college, I was originally um, going to be a political science major um, because I wanted to go to law school. And it just so happened that that year, um, the political science department was in Wharton. Uh, and when I got to Wharton, it had moved out of Wharton. So I was, admit, so I was a Wharton student, but um, not, you know, not in the, in the college where political science was offered. But long story short is I loved the finance part of it, um, started getting into that, um, ended up graduating and working for um, in the banking industry, and then thought to myself, you know, what happened to that little girl that wanted to be a lawyer? Um, and I really kind of started thinking about it and thinking about it and said, you know what, I will regret it if I don't do it. And so that's when I decided to go, when, to go back to school. I was going to go back to law school, um, but I wasn't going to forget my, my interest in finance, so I was going to do the MBA as well. Uh, but it was important to me to 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 kind of live out that little girl dream to be a lawyer. And you managed to graduate both with your MBA and your JD in 1995, but from two different schools. How did you manage that? Well, that was a bit of creativity um, because um, because I was a finance major in Wharton, and I love finance. I didn't want to go to um, another program, MBA program that had a lesser finance um, program. Uh, I wanted to go to, you know, kind of level up. And at that time, leveling up in finance meant the University of Chicago. And I, it was just so happened that the way the University of Chicago arranges their business school program is that you take your first year in the business school but the second year of the program, you can take anywhere you want. And so I was able to talk to the two schools and stack my um, second year of the business school at the law school at Chicago and have Boston College just treat that as a third year visiting student at another law school and have um, the business school just treat that as my second year elective program. Um, And so it took a lot of talking, a lot of deans, a lot of approvals, um, but that's how I ended up getting that done in four years rather than having to do three and two. That's amazing. And you had that all set up before you started law school? Uh, No, I was thinking about it, 
um, when I was going into the process um, and then just worked on it. And so I had nailed it down. I knew by the time of the end of my first year of law school that you know I had gotten the approvals to move to move forward. That's amazing. And did you ever, um, after law school, did you go practice finance or did you always um, practice as an attorney? Uh, no, I always practiced as an attorney and was, but was lucky enough that all in each of my practice areas, it always had like a business finance component. Um, so it was always banking clients, investments, even at the DOJ, I worked on mergers, looking at the structure of transactions and that sort of thing. So everything I've done legally on the, on, on, is, has been really heavily on the business and finance side. So I got to have the best of both worlds. I'm sure you have much more um, of the finance uh, perspective than most attorneys <laughs> coming out of law school anyway. Yeah. And it was helpful too, that when I was on the business school side, you know, and people would learn that I, what I was doing, they were like, oh, you know, we don't like attorneys because all attorneys do is tell us no, tell us no. And so I got to gain a good perspective of, okay, this is what I don't want to do. I don't want to be the no person, but I do want to be the person that kind of brings discipline to the table. And so my approach has always been with my clients to give no, but here are our other options um, and be able to assess those options um, in, a, in a meaningful way so the client doesn't get into trouble, but the client doesn't feel shut down. And so that's, that's like, yeah, very that's extremely helpful. valuable. Yeah, it's been very, it's been very helpful to me in my career. So after law school, what was your first job? So after law school, my first job um, was with a law firm, um, it just on a temporary basis. I really, I started working in my summer. I did a summer with the Department of Justice in the Antitrust Division. Um, and the Antitrust is great because it kind of gives you um, a peek into litigation, but still a peek into the corporate side. And uh, at that time, the Department of Justice had a, a big hiring freeze and folks wanted me to come back. Um, but they were like, ah, oh, you might have to wait a year or so. So I spent a year or so just working at um, Deborah Boys and Plimpton, a large mm -hmm. um, law firm on a couple of antitrust matters. Um, and as soon as something opened up at Justice, I applied and then joined um, the merger task force. Um, and so that was my first, um, to me, official um, legal job because that was the one that I had my eye on um, right out, out of law school. And how did your experience at the DOJ influence your private practice throughout the rest of your career? Um, it was it influenced, It was great because at DOJ, at that point in time, there were so many mergers going on. Actually, I was in the merger task force that they, unlike a law firm, there wasn't this, oh, you're too junior to do X. Mm -hmm. It was as much as you want to do, as much as you can do, we're going to let you do it because there's a lot of stuff to be done. And so I just learned a lot. I, I was able to lead cases very early on. Um, I was able to really kind of dig my teeth into things that much more senior attorneys would be dealing with. So I, as a young attorney, I was a justice for maybe three years. In that three years, my counterpart was a partner at a law firm. You know, I'd have to be negotiating with somebody at a white and case or or some a large firm like that. And I had to be able to hold my own. And so what that taught me is two things, not to be intimidated because I was a young lawyer and how could I equalize kind of the disparity in experience. And that was just by knowing the transaction and knowing everything that had to be um, negotiated ahead of time. So I really, you know, worked to know my stuff. Um, and that's something that's always helped me because I, I rarely wing it. I tell people what I'm negotiating. I don't bluff. I do my homework <laughs> ahead of time. I know I've looked at this already. We don't have to, you know, we can waste time, but um, I, I really try to stay um, ahead of the game by really immersing myself into the details um, at all times. So what made you leave the DOJ? Sounds like it was a great experience and you were getting really good work. 
Yeah, it was a, it was a great experience, um, but I did decide that the litigation side of it um, was something that one at DOJ we weren't really getting. We weren't, you know, a lot of cases when it was going to litigation, it was going to outside firms, and so my thought was I was more interested in kind of the deal stuff, and so my decision was that if I wanted to, kind of not get pigeonholed in my career as an antitrust lawyer, I needed to branch out mm -hmm. to a broader corporate practice. And the best corporate practice was going to be in New York. Uh, and I was also from New York. Um, so I decided, you know, I'm either gonna always be an antitrust attorney or I'm gonna branch out. And so I decided that to take that chance and, and branch out um, to be, you know, to, to broaden my skills on the corporate side. How did you decide to join uh, was it Seward and Cassell? Um, I decided to join Seward and Cassell because it was, I had heard a lot of bad things about big law firms. And so I was looking for a law firm experience um, that was going to be humane. And at that time, mm -hmm. Seward and Kissel was very much um, what they call a lifestyle firm. Um, but they had some great, practices. They were number one hedge fund um, firm at the time. Uh, they, it, was, it, was a, it was a practice where I could also use my antitrust because the part, one of the partners there was um, broadening her, merges, her merger practice. And so it just seemed a good fit to be able to use the skills that I had and also broaden my skills on the corporate side with uh, a manageable environment that still was going to teach me kind of the law firm life. Yeah, I don't know what happened to the lifestyle firms. It doesn't seem like <laughs> any of them promote themselves that way these days. Yeah, that 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 fell to the wayside maybe a year or two um, after I got there. Uh, so you're at Stewart and Castell for uh, about 11 years, is that right? Yes. And then you moved on to Denton. So what made you make the leap from from there to Denton, which is a much larger firm, obviously? So yeah, so having had, you know, kind of had having had the mid mid-sized firm um, experience under my belt, I again wanted to um, kind of expand to more international transactions. Mm -hmm. um, and Seward and Kissel was really focused on their hedge fund practice. Um, it was really um, and, and my clients were really kind of doing only one one real type of transaction and, and was local, you know, U.S. domestic. And so again, I felt like I'm going to either keep doing this or I'm going to have need, um, I'm going to break away to have an opportunity to broaden my skills, to do international transactions, larger transactions, uh, to be kind of part of um, a bigger, um, slice of, of the market than what I had been working on. And so that's why I made the, the switch to Denton's. And you were at Denton's for about five years and then you decided to to branch out on your own. That, that's a big decision. How did you make yeah. that decision? Uh, well, it was, it was twofold. It, it, was, it was a little bit by necessity. Um, about a year or so before I left Denton's, uh, my grandmother was diagnosed with um, dementia. And so I started having to, um, you know, and she was at the point where she was kind of able to, you know, do things on her own still, but she needed supervision. So I had started having to like leave work to make sure she had her lunch and leave a little early to make sure she was having dinner and to kind of do those type of things. And I felt badly. I felt like, you know, I was, not you know devoting enough time to work but you know obviously that's my grandmother and i'm not going to sacrifice her for anything and so i started thinking you know some of the clients that i had at denton's i brought from seward and kissel and i had been with me for such a long time yeah. that i was like you know and then obviously as you as you work for law firms for a long time you realize it's a bit of a racket where you're bringing in money <laughs> and you're giving it to, you know, a piece of it to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so in thinking about, you know, the clients that I had for a long time and that I was bringing, you know, these clients, the revenue in, 
at a time when law firms were also short on services. Um, so the things that even were beneficial about being in a law firm were kind of getting squeezed. And I said to myself, I would have much more time um, if I could just focus on those clients that I've had for a long time. Mm -hmm. I know their schedule, they know my schedule. I will be able to be a better assistance to my grandmother without the stress of saying, hey, I'm not, you know, I'm not around and not in the office. I'm coming back at this time. And so I was able to sit down with them. So I tell people I wasn't very courageous. I was sat down with my clients and said, hey, do you need me to be at a law firm to, you know, provide you with the services <clears throat> I've been providing you with? Um, and, and if you do, can I go smaller or, or what, what are your thoughts? And to my, you know, surprise and, and benefit, each of them said, hey, Renee, whatever you want to do, we're with you. Uh, and so I was able to, you know, make the decision to kind of go private, but I had my clients with me um, that I had had for a very long time. And so in that I had the revenue from them and then I had the freedom to kind of take care of my grandmother and then also plan her care. Um, she has full-time care now, that was many years ago, but to, you know, work with her in the process to get her the things that she needed while also being able to, you know, do the things that I had to do on the work side. That's great that your clients were so um, loyal um, and happy yeah. to be with you. Yeah, well, I was, I was, I told people like, yeah, I was lucky. I'm not, not courageous. Well, it's not just lucky. It's a testament to the, the service that you provided them for all those years. So they trusted in building up that trust, right? The relationship. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, that's true. I find that more and more you learn this every day in our field that it really all comes down to the relationships, you know, no matter what marketing you do or what, um, you know, what, what school you went to, or even where you started your career, if you can't build a relationship with their client, you're not going to have any business, right? Cool. So. Correct. That is very <laughs> true. So you also work at a um, pretty fairly large role at a, a nonprofit university settlement. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So university settlement is one of the oldest settlement houses here in the city. And when we say settlement house, it's just an approach um, that says when there's an issue with an individual, you kind of just don't look to uh, solve the problem for the individual, but you look to their entire uh, community, uh, their entire family. It's a very holistic approach because you can't have somebody um, that you're assisting if they don't have the proper support at home, right? So it doesn't work. Um, and so I joined the University Settlement maybe about 10 years ago, um, just because I felt like, you know, it's easy to go to work and get caught up with the things that you're doing in, in your personal life. Um, and you can say, oh, I'm going to give back. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But for me, I needed to say, OK, I'm going to do it. And this was a way to say, OK, this is the way that I'm going to to give back. And uh, it's been so rewarding. Um, the University Settlement does programs for low-income New Yorkers across the gamut. It goes from Head Start uh, and child care mm -hmm. um, to um, elder care, uh, English as a second language, housing assistance um, for folks who are, are being evicted, to mental health programs. Um, it all really focuses on um, the huge need that folks have in the city um, for services and for, for care, quite frankly, and to be able to organize that and deliver it um, across a wide spectrum in an efficient manner in a way that changes people's lives and, and helps them get through it. That sounds like a great organization. What is your role there specifically? So I am actually the co-chair um, of the board um, and primarily that role means just making sure, you know, get having good stewardship over the organization, um, making sure that we're meeting our goals um, to service um, the folks that we service, um, making some business decisions. Um, we, while I was been co-chair, we've had to, you know, hire a new uh, CEO. 
Uh, we, I've always told people it's nonprofit, but the things that you, the issues that come up are just as uh, the same issues that come up in a, in a for-profit. So we've had to hire a, a CEO. Um, we've had a, 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 a demerger. We were merged. We had an affiliation with another organization that we then kind of decoupled. Um, we've had to, you know, look at our programs definitely during COVID and make decisions about, you know, what what programs are we going to, you know, make sure that we focus on and, and make sure that they maintain vi are vi viable, uh, and what programs are we, you know, not able to maintain. Uh, we've made a considerable um, decision to make sure that we maintain our presence in mental health. It's a been uh, it's very challenging in New York City and very costly to deliver mental health services, and a lot of um, nonprofits have exited that business. Um, but we felt that it was important to, to not exit and to be there. And so we've made a commitment to make sure that we, um, you know, shore up that and focus on those on ways to do that, uh, provide those services efficiently and to also bring the city's attention, um, to, to the need. Yeah. Mental health is obviously, um, huge issue um, in every major city and really every town, I think in the, in the country and especially after COVID, it's only become more pervasive as a need. So the fact that we don't fund it well as a society is a, is very troubling, but it's good to hear that they're focused, you are focusing on that. Um, yeah, and, and like and I said, it, it's not just, um, you know, the person comes in and they have an issue, but the the settlements approach is, okay, let's then go into the home and see what are the issues in the home that might be contributing to the mm -hmm. issue. How can we not just help the person, but help the family um, as part of the solution and going forward. Um, and that's, you know, that, that happens across different programs. You, you might find a, a student that's truant, that's having problems in school um, but they're having problems in school because maybe they have to watch their little brother or sister because the mother works. And so you can uh, be addressing the child and the truancy, but if you don't go into the home and see what else is happening and make sure that, okay, instead of your teenager providing the daycare, we can get some daycare so that your child can go to school. So that's the kind of approach to problem solving um, that I just thought was was it made so much sense once I joined the organization. Yeah. Um, but you don't uh, automatically think of it when you're just thinking, oh, I'm just deliver you know, delivering services in a program. And how do you think you used your legal training in that role at University Settlement, sort of thinking about the problems and problem solving? Uh, I think lawyers are, are kind of by nature problem solvers. Um, and so, you know, in thinking about and, and, and being strategic. So in thinking about, you know, who was the best person for the CEO role? Um, what are the programs that we might need to uh, expand on? What are the ones we need to contract on? You kind of sometimes bring a strategic um, mindset to it. Um, as a lawyer, sometimes you do have to, you know, read a contract here and a, a contract there. Um, sometimes, you know, I've, I've helped out with, you know, small matters that, that have come up. Um, evaluating um, university settlement often gets um, overtures from other programs or from the city to assist um, or, or take on other programs. And so evaluating, you know, is that a good fit for us? What's the liability for us if, if we got in, if we took that on? Um, and just advising sometimes uh, along with regular counsel as to whether or not uh, we think an opportunity is appropriate for us to, to follow up on. And what do you value most about having your law degree, Renee? I value most the ability, as much as I like the, the corporate stuff and all that, I value the ability to help regular people. Um, some of my, and, and I always tell people, um, there's no point in having a fancy degree if you can't use it to help somebody. And so there are countless folks 
that you know need help and can't afford a lawyer. Um, and what I hope that I do is I bring to those folks the same quality service that they would get from a big firm lawyer um, at no charge. Uh, I've been able to help. The story I like to tell is I had a tennis instructor. He had a, a concession to teach tennis in the park for like 20 years or something like that. And the city changed the rules and he didn't know. And he lost the concession. And he came to me and he says, everybody says I, there's nothing I can do. And I said, well, look, let me look over some things. Let me look. And what I found is that the city has to give notice before they change something like that. And so I wrote a couple of letters and said, you know what? You have to give notice. You can't you just change it. And he had lost the bid. And somebody said, well, you lost the bid anyway. I said, well, no, if you give notice, you have to rebid it. And I wrote a few letters. I didn't even have any conversation. I wrote a few letters. Uh, and actually the city went back and rebid this thing. He, I told him, make the, cha make the change they wanted you to make. Yeah. And he made the change they wanted him to make. He rebid it and he won. Oh, fantastic. And it was, you know, and he was so happy and he was so grateful. And that's the sort of thing um, to me being a lawyer is about. It's really helping someone who has the law on their side, but they can't access it. Mm -hmm. And to be able to give that access um, and to treat it seriously. And not just say, oh, no, you can't fight. Because yet a lot of people say, you can't fight City Hall. Forget about it. <laughs> you, just needed you, somebody, <laughs> you just needed somebody to take some time mm -hmm. and, and look at it. And so that, that's what I like. And I, I, there's a, many times that I've been able to um, help someone who just needed time and attention uh, from a lawyer that they couldn't ordinarily get. Well, that's, that's wonderful that you're able to take that time to, to do that and offer those services to those that might not be able to afford your usual rates. Um, <laughs> you do have a life outside of, of work. Um, so how do you balance it? You know, balance between the, the law work and, and your personal life? I try to make sure that I schedule time for myself. Um, because you have you get caught in the trap where you have all of these things to do and it's overwhelming. <laughs> and what I found is that that happens for me because I, you know, you say yes to everything and you fill up your schedule. Mm -hmm. And the only person that you don't say yes to ahead of time is yourself. Yeah. Um, so I always try to have time in my schedule um, every day or every other day where there's don't say yes between five and seven. Five and seven is for you to do X. Um, and to have that balance. Or so when you're feeling that you're burnt out, a lot of people are like, I'm feeling burnt out. I'm going to just keep going. It's like, no, when you feel that way, it's time to stop. Stop, take an hour, take two hours. Nothing, the world is not, we tend to think the world's going to go out of whack if we're just not um, making it happen. But you can stop making it happen for an hour and give yourself that permission to just say, I got to. I got to check out. I got to give myself a break. And so what I've learned over the years is to do that. And that's been incredible balance for me. That's, that's a great tip. <laughs> I think, especially for young lawyers getting into the, the profession, you need to block out time for yourself as well. Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. So we're on to our last three questions. These are sort of the rapid fire questions. Uh, Sometimes it works out that way. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't go to law school, what career would you have chosen? Uh, I think I would have just stayed in finance. I would have just, um, you know, stayed in, in banking. I, I was, I loved, I had a, a job as a, a equity analyst. So I would look, be looking at um, different um, portfolios and, and returns and that sort of stuff. And I was a geek about that. I love that stuff. So I probably would have still still done that. And maybe been a writer. I love to, I love what part of the legal stuff is writing and I love writing as well. Oh, there might be a book in you yet, right? It <laughs> could be. Could be. <laughs> what is the one thing you wish you knew when you graduated from law school that you know now? Um, that you don't have to climb every ladder. Um, 
you can, I think I spent a lot of time at Seward and Kissel, even though I felt, you know, it was time to go. I felt like I've been there long enough. I, you know, I need to make it to the next rung. I need to make it to this rung. And then you learn that, you know what? The rungs really don't, as we said, don't mean anything. It's about your relationships. Mm -hmm. It's about the knowledge that you bring to yourself um, as a lawyer, whether you grow your skills. It's no point being a partner somewhere where your skills are not growing, where you're not challenging yourself as a lawyer. Um, it's no point being a partner if being defined as a partner is just about the dollars that you bring in. Um, and so I kind of learned not to kind of buy into um, kind of the, the routine that we get into is this is what we have to achieve. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, the, you have to achieve what you want to achieve, what makes you um, happy and satisfied. And it doesn't matter what it really looks like to everyone else. That's great advice. And would you recommend a law career to women seeking, uh, considering law school today? I would. Um, I think that whether or not you actually want to practice law, it going to law school is one of the best educational experiences I've had. You'll never get three years to muse about things and to bounce ideas off of people, to take the opposite side of an argument, um, to be able to stand up on your feet and defend a point. Um, it is some. It is an education that works across the board in a in a number of areas and being analytical, even the finance sense. Um, it is something that will serve you well in whatever career you choose, um, even if it's not law. And so I do, I do recommend it. I recommend it in a, in a humane setting. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the reasons I went to Boston college is because they were, they were Jesuits and they believed that being a lawyer was about helping people and, and community. Um, so if you learn it in a, in a, if you, get the education in an environment that's supportive, um, I think it's a wonderful experience. I went to um, Boston University, uh, both undergrad and law school. So school in Boston is also a great, great experience. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Something just said about Boston, you know, it's a, it's a small enough city that I think as a, as a student, it's definitely, um, you know, has a, a good, nice appeal. It's got, um, good amenities, small enough that you could walk around. Right. It's not overwhelming, um, which, you know, other larger cities can be sometimes. Yeah. And you can connect. I remember I've, I went over to meet the law students at, at, at BU. Mm -hmm. uh, we met people at Harvard. We met people at Northeastern. You know, it's a yeah. good way to kind of be, you know, connect um, and network as well. Yeah. A lot of students there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. A lot. Thank you so much, Renee. This has been wonderful. It's been really a joy getting to know you and learning about your career. And I hope we're able to connect again offline as well. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. You've been listening to Success in Brief with your host, Roseanne Felicello. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and sharing the show with others. You can catch prior episodes at www.felicellolaw.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Twitter, and more.